welcome again we will be discussing the ncert class 10th economics chapter 2 that is sectors of economy when we classify the sectors we predominantly say there are three sectors the primary secondary and the tertiary sector so that is as per uh, when we follow the ncert textbooks however under this session we would be discussing two more important sectors of recent you those are the quaternary sector and the quinary sector now let's first start with the primary sector so as the name suggests it is related to primary activities so everything that relates directly to nature would come under primary sector so it's dependent predominantly or i would say solely on the natural factors for example agriculture dairy mining fishery and forestry so all these are directly dependent on the natural resources and therefore they are classified under primary sector the next is the secondary sector under secondary sector what we are doing is we are changing the form of the natural product that we have so it could be either in the industries in the factories now these could be either home based industries or uh, big industrial setups so it could be workshops small factories big factories or home based uh, artisan workshops we can say so all these are classified under industrial sector so we also call secondary sector as industrial sector for example from the earth we get bricks and we transform these bricks or use these bricks to make the building and therefore what we are trying to explain here is from the natural resource that we are getting we are changing it to some other form to use it or to utilize it and this is not a direct product from the nature so from the nature you direct you don't directly get the buildings as such the next is the tertiary sector under the tertiary sector what we do is we try to explain any kind of support that is given to primary or secondary sector so any support that we provide to primary or secondary sector would be classified as tertiary sector so for example i have an agricultural produce on my piece of land and this agricultural produce that is extra on my piece of land i want to transport it to some other region so some other set of land i want to transport this extra agricultural produce so what we will do is we will try to use transportation and this transportation would be a tertiary sector because we are providing a support facility to the primary sector so again transportation communication banking storage trade all these are kind of tertiary sector activities now of recent what we have done is we have further classified tertiary sector under different heads so whatever services are generated are called as tertiary sector therefore we also call this sector as service sector similar to the secondary sector which is also known as industrial sector now when we extend the dimension of tertiary sector we can go as quaternary sector and quinary sector quaternary sector involves intellectual activities so all research and education research and development it related jobs consultancy jobs all these would fall under uh, quaternary services or quaternary sector because we are adding something to the services so all kind of better of services or higher order services that would be a good word to use so all kind of higher order services would be classified under quaternary sector further the topmost level of services which is or which involves decision making would be part of quinary sector and this predominantly includes the top executives and the top officials so these are the five sectors that we talk about however under ncert we have broadly classified these under three sectors so for the remaining lecture we'll work around with those three sectors as the predominant basis now how do we count goods and services now this is a very very important concept to understand to avoid any kind of double counting what we need to do is we need to make sure that 
the product that we are adding is added only once so there is a single addition of the product so let's take an example the farmer supplies wheat to the flour mill at a rate of rupees 8 per kg the flour mill grinds the wheat and provides it to the bis biscuit factory at the rate of 10 rupees per kg and finally this bis biscuit factory uses flour sugar etc and packaging and finally provides the packed biscuits at a rate of rupees 20 per packet what does this mean now this packed biscuit would have the ingredient of wheat the biscuit factory would again have ingredient as wheat flour mill would again have ingredient as wheat and the farmer is definitely supplying wheat so this wheat is added at all the four steps now if i take wheat at this stage that won't be the correct way to add it because this wheat is again an ingredient here therefore whenever we are counting goods and services it's very important that we go on for the final value that is counted and final value that is the packed biscuit would automatically include all the intermediate stages so all the intermediate stages which will be using wheat would automatically be included in the final product so whenever we are counting goods and services we go for the final product and not for the intermediate product that's a very 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 important uh, concept to understand now let's talk about what is gdp or gross domestic product now gross domestic product is the summation of the production that is done through the primary activities secondary activities as well as the tertiary activities so the value of all these final goods from all these three sectors would count towards the gross domestic product and when we talk about the gross net product the net domestic product sorry the net domestic product would remove any kind of depreciation from this gross amount and that would give you the net product so you have the gdp minus depreciation that would give you ndp that's the net domestic product so any kind of losses that you are incurring in the process would be subtracted from the final value of goods and services and that would lead you to the net domestic product and this gdp helps us understand how big the economy is now we will understand the classification of gdp based on various sectors like if we broadly talk about the various countries india is predominantly an agricultural land so most of the people here are employed in agricultural sector so primary sector becomes important for china it's manufacturing that is important however if we take example of united states it would be the service sector that would have a predominant position however in india the uh, the trend is changing and there is a shift from the primary sector activities to tertiary sector activities now the most important thing to note here is however there is a shift from primary sector activities to tertiary sector activities the employment in terms of employment we still have the highest employment for primary sector activities however if we talk about the value of the goods and services that we are uh, producing so you have the gdp in terms of gdp you have tertiary sector that contributes the highest however despite of the fact that most of the people are employed in primary sector that means the employment in primary sector is extra so there are extra people engaged in primary sector activities even that means even if i remove those people or i take those people away from the primary sector activity my net output would not change so there would be no impact on my output even if i remove a set of people from that complete uh, primary sector activity that means you have a kind of disguised unemployment 
that is present or prevalent in the primary sector. So we will see further uh, more about it. Now, the tertiary sector is the largest producing sector in India since 2000. What is happening is in villages it was predominantly an agricultural base till now. However, with changing ten trends, there are more services that are moving into villages. These services are in form of healthcare. These are in form of education. These are in form of banking. And all these activities are directly or indirectly, uh, I would say these are kind of service sector activities. Again, with the changing trends, you have kind of decentralization of industrial setup that is taking place and smaller industries are being located to semi-urban and rural hinterlands. Therefore, you have numerous industrial sector or secondary sector that is growing up in the nearby villages. Again, with the development of agriculture, there is a need to increase the transport because whatever is produced must be transported and stored. So, you have Agriculture development that would again lead to development of the tertiary sector. Again, with increasing income, more people are moving towards tourism, restaurants. So, all these are tertiary sector activities. So, again, we can say the idea of tertiary sector activity is nowadays increasing in India. And whatever new services are coming up, specifically in the hubs like Bangalore, you have the, uh, the information technology centers. So, those are again the tertiary sector activities that are cropping, uh, booming up. Now, what is important to think around here is our industrial output has increased 8 times since the past decades. However, the employment has ro risen by only uh, 2.5 times. That means we are producing more but the employment for industrial sector is not matching it. Again, service sector production has increased 11 times, but employment has increased by less than 1%. When it comes to agriculture, we have more than 50% of the population that is engaged in agriculture, which is contributing to less than 25% of the net GDP of the nation. That means, as we talk, there is the problem of underemployment or disguised and unemployment that is seen. And because of this, you have extra workers that are present on the field. Even if I remove those workers, there would be no impact on the final outcome or the final output. So what should be the ways by which we can create more employment? By providing irrigation facilities, so more people would be involved in the task of irrigating and channelizing or canal diversions. Then you would have investments in transport sector. So more people getting involved in transportation, banking sector, health sector, education sector. Moving of industries from core urban areas to semi-urban and rural vicinities. Opening up cold storage facilities for agricultural produce and the kind of perishable produce that we have. As the statistics show, only two thirds of the children attend school. So there is a need for more education and therefore opening up of schools would require more staff. So again, there would be increase in the tertiary sector and employment. There would be improvement in tourism and there is a scope for an extra 35 lakhs jobs that could be generated by tourism. Again, one of the missions that is National Rural Employment Guarantee Act 2005 state a guarantee of minimum of 100 days of employment per year. That means if government is unable to fulfill these 100 days of an empl employment, the government would have to pay the compensation in lieu of these 100 days. So this is a kind of employment guarantee that is being provided in the rural areas. So all these efforts would help definitely increase the employment opportunities for those who are predominantly struck up in the areas of underemployment or disguised unemployment. Now, when we classify sectors, we can we already classified one way where we talked about the primary, secondary and the tertiary sector based on the type of activities. Then based on the formal structure or the structure, we have two types of 
sectors that is the organized sector and the unorganized sector organized sector is much more formal so there is assured employment it comes under the regulations of factory act minimum wages act the organization must be registered again since it's a kind of set organization you would have more job security you would have to work for fixed hours there would be a paid leaves holidays vacations and all the benefits that would be given to the employee medical benefits and retirement benefits are also part of organized sector however when it comes to unorganized sector it is more small and scattered you do not have a whole day guarantee or a full day employment again if you have a full day employment there is no guarantee that you would have the employment every day every next day so it's kind of very seasonal or a uh, fluctuating employment that one has so there are irregularities in the job structure and the unorganized sector is paid very less as compared to the organized sector again they are devoting less hours to work and there is kind of uh, uh, seasonal em employment that is seen the important thing to note here is the concept of social security that was recent that is being recently in news so the unorganized sector is the basic focus for the social security projects that are moving forward in india so for this you must refer the complete class on social security in india where we have covered the various schemes of social security specifically which would help the unorganized sector move forward now how can you protect the workers of unorganized sector first of all the most important thing is they should not have the fear of losing the job so there is job security that is essential element for protecting the unorganized sector again some of the organized sectors are shifting towards unorganized sectors in order to evade tax and that should be controlled or curbed 80% of the farmers are small and marginal farmers so you have kind of a uh, uh, huge number of landless laborers that are employed in the, on those patches of land so there should be a kind of land consolidation acts that should move forward that would help in kind of proper organization or cooperative farming that could be again a, a solution for uh, getting a more organized framework for agricultural laborers street vendors rag pickers uh, casual workers in construction and trade are all part of unorganized sectors again majority of the people from uh, scst and obcs are part of unorganized sector all these could be curbed only by government efforts because government is the sole motive or the mover of uh, changes specifically for the unorganized sector the final classification of sectors is based on ownership based on ownership we can say there can be either public sector activities or private sector activities private sector activities are controlled by private companies like tata reliance etc however when it comes to public sector companies they are under the government influence so all the companies like sale the steel authority then you have the post offices railways are part of the public system and you have the only way the money is generated is through taxes so government finally is getting money from the taxes and it is using the same money for the uh, overall development of the nation now how does the government support the farmers we have already covered this in class 9 chapter we have talked about the public distribution system the buffer stocks just a quick recap of those government can support for cheap education or free education for health facilities for banking facilities for subsidized electricity to industrial setups besides this government supports the agricultural laborers by providing uh, the minimum support price for their crop even if there is a kind of drought or famine situation that occurs the farmer would get a minimum base price and that would be the minimum support price that the fci provides to the farmers again the people who are living below poverty line are provided subsidized food grains and these subsidized food grains are provided through the various fair shops or we call as the uh, the fair price shops or the ration shops and this occurs by means of the public distribution system that we have again 
government has an important role in providing safe drinking water housing and nutrition facilities so with this we cover the class 2 uh, sorry the class 10 chapter 2 for economics will be covering further topics in economics in the coming sessions have a good day ahead